The industrial agriculture has, has been the main reason that we've really destroyed our farm ecosystems and our soil ecosystems. Like, no one have put, puts ecology in the same sentence as agriculture. But the reason we've destroyed our farms and our soil is, is actually we've destroyed the farm ecosystem. When I started mimicking natural systems here, the easier the work became, became a lot less work and the more profitable it became. My name's Colin Sice. I live on this farm here called Winona, which is Central Tablelands, New South Wales, about 20 kilometres north of Golgong. Merino Wool is the main enterprise. Also, a few other enterprises that we have here is uh, we, we, we grow oats and uh, harvest native grass seed. We have kelpie dogs, merino ram sales amongst our enterprise mix. My, my family's been here, or well, my great grandfather settled here in the 1860s, and then grandfather, and my, then my father started, I guess, this, uh, with the forerunner of industrial agriculture in the 1930s and grew wheat right through this farm. But he grew wheat for 20 years straight and destroyed the farm, basically. I had huge gullies through it. Um, where we're sitting here is very close to a gully that would have been three metres deep. It was a great source of embarrassment to him that he really destroyed the family farm. So he fixed it, uh, filled the gullies in. He found that he had no grassland left. All the native grassland was destroyed for those wheat-growing years. And so, so he adopted really the early green revolution, or the stuff that started from the 1950s, and re pastures and added a lot of fertilizers to make those pastures grow, subclavers, uh, uh, ryegrasses, all of that, a lot of superphosphate. It worked extremely well in that era, and it was profitable. No one could have foreseen the ecological damage that, that, that was happening and did happen on this farm. But the real cruncher came in 1979 when we had a major bushfire here and the flames came through probably 30 feet high, 10 metres high and we were caught in it um, and I was burnt in it. Very frightening to be involved in something like that. And it came in through from the northwest and burnt the whole farm. We lost uh, 3,000 of our merino sheep uh, killed in that fire. All the buildings were destroyed and all, virtually all the fencing was destroyed. We had nothing left, it was just a blackened ruin. We went from a financial situation of going okay to being just instantly broke overnight. So that was a real challenge in, in how, just how, how to survive financially. I started to work out how I could do this without spending any money at all which was the reason that, that I developed a lot of the things that I did. Through the 1980s were, were a period of change and most of them were about not spending money. The first thing that, that wasn't used was, was the fertiliser. The native grasses started to return and then because I, I knew that they didn't need high levels of fertiliser, they didn't need any fertiliser, I started to concentrate on actively managed for restoring grassland. And one of the things that came out of that was a change to grazing management, to holistic grazing. I'd heard of Alan Savory at that stage. Alan Savory was advocating rotational type grazing. I mobbed up some sheep and did some trials here. I saw that was going to work, so I adopted that. And also, around that time in the 1980s, I'd, I'd changed from ploughing to direct drilling. However, I was still using fairly high rates of, of uh, fertiliser and pesticides, very same as, as people do now. So I started to look at native grasses and the fact that we were killing them with herbicide, I started to look at another way of doing it. That's where pasture cropping came from. It was a, a, a discussion with and then a good friend of mine, Daryl Clough, about why are we killing these, these native grasses it's their summer grasses, they go dormant in the winter, go to sleep for the winter. So there's no reason to kill them if we're planting a crop into them that's growing in the winter. And that's simply how natural systems work, how grasslands function. I gradually saw the grassland evolve and the species started to, to return. Now to a point where there's 60 native grassland species, grasses, forbs and herbs. 
When I first started, I found about nine. Now it's been documented, well, Sydney University documented as 80% of, of our pastures now are native species. And now we can grow crops as, as good as a conventional crop. But the advantage of it is that we can grow a crop into these grasslands so we've got something green growing all of the time. And we sow probably half of our crops now to, to multi-species crops. So very high quality grazing. But we can also harvest grain from them as well. That adds up to a lot more profit to start with, but one of the great benefits of it is that it will restore the grasslands. It'll stimulate the germination of grassland species seed that's in the soil. So we can very rapidly restore grasslands and restore perennial species. The consequences of that have been amazing in that the birds have changed totally here on the farm. We used to have a lot of uh, sparrows and starlings, basically European weed species. They are no longer here, you don't see them. However, there's a huge increase in, in our native species. I've counted about 115 uh, in, like, species here, all different types of birds, and I certainly don't remember them being here as, as a teenager. There's been uh, insect counts done here. In the insect numbers, there was 600% increase in, in, in insects and 125% increase in diversity of insects. Spiders, predatory wasps, those types of things, which could it control the, the, uh, the plant damaging insects. Now, we, I know the farm ecosystem has totally changed and shifted. The soil health has, has increased enormously, you know, six and seven hundred percent increase in all soil microbes. Now that means that we don't get crop diseases or plant diseases, fungal diseases, because of the, the, the soil ecosystem is managing those. Always looked at ramping this up, so I started looking at multi-species crops, combinations of species, up to 10 species, in a mix, also on at the same time, which is increasing carbon and, and increasing nutrient cycling in the soil, so a lot of benefits. That allowed me to virtually eliminate fertiliser. There's been no superphosphate put on pastures here for nearly 40 years. I haven't used fungicides or, or uh, insecticides for about 30 years. But the reason that that can be done is the farm ecosystem is driving everything, like Mother Nature is driving it. We don't need those inputs because it's happening, happening naturally. I go onto, onto properties that, or meet someone uh, at, a, at, at a workshop, then, then go onto a property to help them. And often they're, they're quite depressed, financially struggling, and, but worse than that, mentally stressed and drained. And then you go back to their place five years later and, and, and they've changed and their whole uh, mental health has changed and everything has changed. We, we need to be careful when we change because stepping off one system onto another, it, it can be financially risky. For example, going organic tomorrow is not the, not the way to do it. We need to transition into organic agriculture. We need to transition in, into, into regenerative agriculture. So that means weaning off over time many of the inputs that we put in because we need to remember that our farm ecosystem, the soil ecosystem, is not functioning yet. So it, it, it has to be a transition. By letting Mother Nature drive it for us, we can actually be more profitable, not less profitable. That was the great revelation to me. You know, we just needed to get out of the way and let Mother Nature drive it all for us. We can do the same thing all over the planet. We just need the will to do it.